In the Gospel of St. Matthew today we read, At that time Jesus taketh Peter and James and John his brother, and bringing them up into a high mountain apart, and he was transfigured before them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The fathers of the church all say that all of God's works are perfect, performed with weight and measure. They are so good that they could not possibly be better. And St. Basil the Great, we should be thoroughly convinced, he says, that we are the work of a good master who with infinite foresight is at all times occupied with us, his creatures. And so we know by this that everything done or permitted by the will of God has a precise purpose in God's plan and that not a single detail does not have or bring about some good which benefits mankind. After all, all things are done ultimately for our sanctification. As St. Paul says today to the Thessalonians, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now, it is part of sacred tradition that the transfiguration of our Lord which takes place in today's gospel, occurred on Mount Tabor. This detail, this fact, is taken for granted by Catholics and just glossed over quickly. But that detail, that fact, was planned out minutely by the wise providence of God. Last week, we saw Christ in the desert and this week we see him on the top of a high mountain. But our Lord had many mountains to choose from, so why is it that he chose this mountain, Mount Tabor, rather than another for his transfiguration? Well, scripture commentators give many reasons, but this is one. It is because here on Mount Tabor, he would allow the three apostles to see him in glory, as it were, before they were to see him in agony, in the passion. And this was done for the purpose to strengthen them so that they would not lose heart in seeing our Savior suffer. And therefore, to give the appear this transfiguration, he chose the most heaven-like of all the mountains in that region to accomplish it. St. Bede tells us about this mountain. It is covered with grass and flowers. It is exceedingly pleasant. It is a sort of paradise. You wouldn't expect that, would you, in the Holy Lands, most of it appearing to be, at least, desert. Another writer tells us what this mountain is like. He says, the climate is most salubrious. It is planted all over with vines and olives and various kinds of fruit and other trees. It is verdant with constant dews, with the foliage of trees and green grass, and is always fragrant with the odor of all kinds of flowers. There is a vast concourse of birds who make delightful melody with their songs. And so it is that our Lord chose this paradise-like mountain to make us think, in the midst of the pains of Lent and of life in general, about heaven. And I think this gospel is very important for our times. After all, there are so many distractions in modern society that pull our thoughts away from heaven to the mundane. Never forget, as we're talking about angels, never forget that the devil, being an angel himself, a fallen angel but nonetheless an angel, is intelligent and knows by many years of experience what methods to use against men to prevent them from 
truly seeking after heaven. The trap is this, that if we do not think seriously about heaven, then we most certainly will not seek heaven in any serious manner. And he knows that all too well. And so while he's got our attention focused, oh, all through the day, on social media and sports, the modern day Roman Colosseum, we are actually, in reality, falling prey to the snares of him whose only goal is to get you not to go to heaven. While our thoughts are earthly, we fail to recognize this one truth. We are so close to eternity. We are a single breath away from eternity. A single heartbeat away from eternity. From heaven or from hell. One instant, one accident, and into eternity we go. So as we see, the one great business in this life is just that to seek heaven in a serious manner. It's the only reason for which we exist. If we do not accomplish this, our salvation, then all was in vain. All of those pains and sufferings of life, all in vain. But God has put a little part of heaven around us all the time, day and night. As we speak, for example, there are multitudes of angels here with us. Angels with whom we know by faith that we are meant to spend eternity with. What a consolation it is that God has given to us in a true veil of tears and of suffering the angels. St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, one day they, the angels, will be our co-heirs just as here below they are our guardians and trustees appointed and set over us by the Father. Now the number of angels, we don't know. Scripture tells us that they are thousands of thousands and tens, ten thousands of ten thousands. In other words, it is a number that no man could count. For every star in all the galaxies have an angel. In fact, they say that the angels actually receive their light, or rather the stars receive their light from the angels. A beautiful thought. Every moon has its guardian. Every town, every church, every family, every person. And every person that has existed from Adam until the last man on earth, they will not share the same angel. Each one will have a different angel. So their number is uncountable. And these angels, we should know, have such a, an affection for us that they will do everything to get us to heaven. And even more, they will do everything to see that we get a higher place in heaven than they possess at present. Such is their fraternal charity towards us. The power of an angel, what is it like? Well, one pious book said that one single angel could defeat millions of men set in battle array. Indeed, he continues, all the men of the world united together, one angel. Their loveliness, this book continues, is perfectly enchanting. It captivates us. Everything about these dear angels enraptures us. Did you know that an angel once appeared to St. Francis of Assisi, the, the seraphic saint, and this angel played an instrument 
merely for the saint's enjoyment. Now, we know that the angel touched the instrument only once, and yet so beautifully did it sound that St. Francis himself told us that if the angel would have continued to play that instrument, he would have died of such an abundance of sweetness. Another true story which is attested to in history, there was once a religious who lived out in the desert, a sort of hermit, and an angel appeared to him and began to sing. The beauty of this angel's chant so captivated him that the hermit miraculously lived for centuries in that desert without fatigue, without weariness, and with so much joy, they say, that he thought that only 15 minutes of his life had passed by. Now imagine what it will be like to hear countless multitude, multitudes of angels, each with a hymn so distinct from all the other angels that it will captivate us for all eternity and never end. These are the sorts of joys that the angels bring. Now, the good angels, who do not have to suffer, remember, have always been most compassionate to those of us, their weaker brothers, who do suffer. I'm thinking of the martyrs in particular. One caught my eye, it was almost by chance this morning, that of the story of St. Eulalia. Twelve years old she was. She was brought before the judge. They offered her all sorts of pleasantries and then threatened tortures. They even took her in and had all the instruments of, of torture laid out on the table, which they would use, they said to her, to tear your flesh and break your bones. Well, the angels came visibly to her, and they, three of them, the first one, well, they all suggested what answers to give to the judge. And when she gave those answers, the judge was completely and utterly confused, confounded, had no answer whatsoever to give. And then they began to visibly encourage little Eulalia. The first angel spoke up and said, suffer for Jesus Christ because he loves you with an infinite love. And the second angel spoke up and said, suffer well, for soon you shall be one of us and will rejoice with us forever. And the third angel spoke, suffer with courage, for you will save many souls by your constancy and example. And then altogether the angels said to Eulalia, don't you wish to be our little sister? So beautifully did they speak that she was completely encouraged. They burned her alive, and then her soul was taken to, a, to heaven by those angels. Or the 40 crowned martyrs of Sebast, most of you, many of you, might already know this story. This was a group of soldiers, and uh, they would not sacrifice to the idols, and so they were sentenced to death. When they were in prison, the men spoke among themselves, these 40 battle-worn soldiers, and they said, we've borne so many hardships and so often exposed our lives in the service of an earthly king and in defense of our country. Shall we do anything less for the king of heaven and for our souls? And so they decided to go through with martyrdom. But before they were taken away, one of the guards would beat their mouth with a stone. 
Then later, all 40 men were taken out onto a frozen lake in the middle of winter to be left there to freeze to death. A hot bath was then placed nearby for those who might change their mind and apostatize. And the 40 men out there on the ice, they all prayed together, Almighty Lord, we are here, we are 40 here present. Grant also that 40 may be crowned. Well, one man defected. He ran over to the hot bath and jumped in, and the change of, between the extreme cold to the extreme warmth, he died, an apostate. Just then, a bright light shone upon the remaining martyrs, and 39 angels descended from heaven, each with a crown which they placed upon the head of the 39 martyrs left out there on the pond. Well, the guard who was there remembered their prayer at the beginning, let there be 40 crowns. He looked out, he saw only 39 men with crowns and knew that one more crown there was. When the other guards woke up, he declared himself a Christian. He flung himself out on the ice and he died a martyr and was crowned by that angel. You see the type of helps that the angels give. So it might not be such a marvelous thing. They might not appear to you, but this, the angels always help us to suffer well. They pray when you're too sick to pray. They suggest pious thoughts in your sickness. They obtain by their prayers all the courage that you need. So today, in Lent, three resolutions. But first, remember, think of heaven, eternity, from which you are only one breath away. It's that close. But the angels are around us now, and we must keep company with them. So here are my three suggestions for this week. To always be in the presence of your guardian angel. Never forget that he's there. Frequently throughout the day, remind yourself of this and pray to him. Secondly, and these two come from the pieces of advice that St. John Bosco gave to the young ones that he took care of, he told them, well, Tuesdays are dedicated to the holy angels. So on Tuesday, offer some mortification in honor of the angels and so please them. And he said, next, remember your birthday. That's interesting, isn't it? But he said, the reason is because the guardian angel was given to you on the day of your birth. In his presence, you, through your godparents, made the baptismal vows. Renew them before your angel. Ask him to help you to persevere in them. But in any case, honor the angels, cherish them. Honor the angels because they wish to help you to heaven, where with them, you will reign forever and ever. May God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. <clears throat>